Welcome everyone and thank you for joining today's webinar with Lifetime Adoption. Um, I love hosting Adoption Story webinars, but these days a lot of the adoption stories we get to share on these live events um, happen more on the uh, exclusive side, on the membership side for families already waiting with Lifetime. And so it's really exciting today to be able to open that up and have a mixed audience here of people who are just starting to think about building their family through adoption, all the way to we have some of you who are actively waiting and then some of you I know are moving through a match. And I even see some familiar faces on here and names of people who have completed their Lifetime adoptions and they just, um, want to come back and hear from another lifetime family or just join us again. So it's really neat to have this variety. Um, my name is Libby Denniston. I just want to thank all of you for making time to be here today. Um, I know that when it comes to adoption, there's just so much information from how do I get started to what does that process look like? And then even after you adopt, what does life after adoption look like? And what does open adoption look like, you know, beyond just getting to know that child's birth mother and, and other things to consider? Um, so it's great to see all of you here. And I think what I love the most about having such a mixed audience is that we get the opportunity to learn from each other too. So if you have questions and comments as we share today's adoption story, feel free to look for that questions box on your screen and we will include as many of those comments and questions as possible. And what's neat too is that sometimes, you know, someone maybe in an early phase of their adoption planning might have a question and then when we bring it up, I love seeing those of you who have, who have moved through that already, that sometimes you bring up your questions or comments too that kind of tag on to that or just build onto the answer to really um, to help each other out too. So we're here as a community, but also primarily we're here to welcome this very, um, special family that we're excited to share their story. Um, just, well, it's been almost a year since they met their baby boy. And if you are joining us online or with the GoToWebinar app, you should be able to see the photos that we have to share today because our special guest sent over a little handful of photos and I'm sure I will get plenty of oohs and ahs because this little peanut is, is quite a cutie. Um, and so hopefully you'll be able to relate to some of Aaron and Kimberly's story or maybe take away some tips or just to be encouraged to know that there are other people who have walked where you've walked today and they are now, you know, living their adoption happy ever after as life, you know, life after adoption and life as new parents. Um, so wherever you are today, I hope that you will just have um, a soft heart and open ears and, and let this speak to you in whatever way could help or move you to that next step um, in this season of your story. So um, Aaron and Kimberly, I just wanna thank you for being here, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know that we planned this today because uh, Aaron's got the day off and then also you do have some quiet time away from Zachary and the dog too. So this is perfect timing. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, now, I do have photos to share and I'll try and keep up with you guys, but while I bring up um, just even the first slide, which I know is um, is actually from the moment when you met your baby boy last year, um, I would love if we could just kind of start at the beginning of your whole story, which goes back to what led you to adoption in the first place. Aww. Oh. <laughs> I know, look how tiny he is. <laughs> so tiny. So we um, we've been married now, going on this this year will be fourteen, 14 year years fourteen, in and uh, yes, uh, on November fifth, and we just always knew we would have kids, and uh, when it when that time when we thought that time was right, it just never seemed to happen, and so we had uh, just basically fertility issues, um, not something that that at all runs in my family or or errands. Yeah. So it was certainly unexpected. And, um, and I, I, we kind of went through the whole thing of just trying to wait it out, trying to see if it would happen. And we talked about adoption years ago, but we just kind of never moved on it. Um, I think Aaron even went and got some information. And at that time, I, I personally was not ready. I, I kind of felt like moving forward back then, with adoption meant that I was giving up. 
-hmm. And so we just, we just kind of went on with our lives and, um, and then we just kind of circled back to it. Um, last year, I guess the end of the year prior, we talked about it a lot and we just kind of went online mm -hmm. and, and searched adoptions and, uh, I'm the kind of person that I really like to to read reviews and, and such, and I just kept seeing Lifetime uh, because I think I might have searched on African American adoptions or um, some other searches, but it all kept leading back to Lifetime, and the reviews were were so uplifting and positive, and uh, even the couple of negative reviews that, that I read were the kind of negative reviews that I was like, oh, okay, if that's why they're upset, then okay. Um, so that's how we, at least on my end, how we ended up uh, really going forward with adoption. Mm -hmm. So when you when you met each other, though, Aaron, Aaron, you had you had children from a previous relationship, right? Yes, I was um, um, married before and married and divorced, and I had um, uh, kids from uh, my previous marriage. But um, when Kim and I met, um, there was a uh, the thought that okay, starting over, and the excitement of of um, uh, having kids again and everything, and starting a new family, and um, things kind of uh, progressed where. Um, we tried and, you know, um, as Kimberly said, there was a uh, fertility issues, but we never gave up. <clears throat> and um, once we uh, um, started to, um, um, the idea of uh, adoption, um, the timing wasn't quite right because we was in between moving and selling the house and everything. So we kind of put it on the, uh, I wouldn't say, uh, forgetting about it, but just putting it to the side for a second. And we finally was able to move and it seemed like the timing and everything became right. And I brought uh, the idea up to uh, Kimberly again. And, but prior to talking with her about it, we had, I kept wondering, okay, is, is now's a good time, now's a good time. And we finally talked and decided to move forward mm -hmm. um, and contact the agency and just move everything forward. But um, during the process of, of deciding to move forward at that time and, and really um, get going, uh, we prayed and uh, uh, made the decision to say, okay, this is the timing is right. We felt the timing was right to move forward with adoption and knowing that uh, the process would take uh, three months, six months, or even a year and just be prepared for that, uh, that waiting period. Yeah. And I think sometimes that, that's its own sort of waiting in a way is going from, well, we would adopt, we, we have considered it, we're thinking about it, to then deciding what is the right timing and how do I know that I'm supposed to take this new journey? Because like you said, Kimberly, I think there's probably a lot of people listening that would would say me too and raise their hand high when you said, you know, I was going through infertility, but I had thought about adoption, but I felt like if I decided to do adoption, that meant I was giving up. And there is something to be said for, in a way, having to grieve what did not happen because of fertility attempts or whatever struggles or losses happened there, to grieve how you thought it was going to look. And then, and then that is, in a way, sort of not giving up, but accepting, okay, what's the what's the next like what's after this um but that that can be a a big hurdle for some people i i picture it's just kind of like a low hill for others it may feel like this really steep mountain that goes on for a long time of just deciding is this the right next step so what would you two from your own experience because it it was a journey for you it sounded like quite a number of years of just hoping that you would grow your family and it wasn't going like you thought it would. And then you're thinking about adoption and then also looking, well, what's the right timing um, to do that? Because there's logistics involved that you don't have to consider when you carry a pregnancy and give birth biologically. Um, what would you say to people who are listening that might be like, you know, I'm right there. I, I think adoption is what's next, but I just, I'm not sure. How do you know that that's the next step or that that's the right time? Um, I think with, with us, like Aaron said, we, 
the, the, the challenges that we did feel were in our way at one point was where we lived previously and uh, we liked our house, but it wasn't children friendly at all. Uh, even when we put it up for sale, the, the only bad things we would have uh, said about it is, you know, we kind of live on a busy road. The backyard was not much of a yard, even though it was huge. It had a gigantic slope to it. And so it just wasn't child friendly yard wise. And so we had made the decision to move, look for a flat yard um, and something more, you know, child friendly. And so that was one of the hurdles that we had. And, um, and again, just being on the same page about moving forward to adopt. So um, I guess I would just say uh, for those, you know, who are thinking about doing it, uh, once you've gotten any other logistical um, obstacles out of the way, then just kind of think, why not? And, uh, and that's kind of, I think, where I was. I think Aaron was, uh, like he said, more ready than I, than I was. And it just took me a little time to come around. Mm -hmm. But um, once we kind of, we, we're here, we're in a, in a house in a, in a great neighborhood. And it was just kind of like, you know, if, if we're going to do it, this is the time to do it. And, um, and just in retrospect, looking back on it, like Aaron said, once we did start the process, I, I can't I can't see of anything we've really moved out to do that went more smoothly. Uh, not to say that that happens for everyone, but it, it just that was our experience. It it was, it was just like sort of meant it, to be. It was exactly. It was as if all the play, all the pieces fell into place, even from financing it uh, down to telling friends. Because for me, uh, because we had. Um, we're not, you know, in our twenties. And so just, just even telling people, you know, um, I, I was overwhelmed. We were overwhelmed mm -hmm. by the response that we got. Um, mm -hmm. I know a couple of my girlfriends were like, uh, and that in particular, yeah. she was like, what were you waiting for? I've been wondering. Yeah. And I wanted to ask, like, people were just <laughs> so overwhelmingly, uh, supportive. And, and that was just for, I don't know why I didn't expect that, but I didn't, and, and it was awesome. Yes. And once um, we'd uh, made a decision to go forward, um, we had to, uh, I wanted to make sure that uh, uh, financially we were able to, and um, being prepared for um, setbacks uh, financially or um, uh, anything that may have been may have been somewhat of a, a setback financially or um that little uh hurdle that may pop up being able to move forward and go just um go over that hurdle nothing um stopping us maybe slowing us down a bit but nothing stopping us on the, uh, our goal mm -hmm. and once we move once we began to move forward it was just a a, a matter of um uh continuously um, um expecting uh things to fall into place and one of the things that um, what, that I thought about was okay in the middle of this of the process uh, getting started. What if uh, uh, Kimberly um, becomes pregnant? Will we stop the process and wait or whatever? And that was just to continue on. If Kimberly became uh, uh, pregnant during the process of the uh, of our adoption, um, we would have continued forward and we would just had you know, two kids, <laughs> but uh, <Yeah. laughs> not stopping the process, no matter what, once we um, uh, gotten started and continue, you know, contact agency and, and everything. So mm -hmm. it was um, uh, full speed ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I hope that helps some of you who, you know, might be in that really early phase is, I, I think one of the things you guys touched on a couple times was just, you got the information um, and that, is that's such a wise point uh, whenever you're trying to make a decision, especially a big one, is just to get more information, get the answers, um, and then just kind of take it one step at a time and see. There was a question that came in earlier. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay. I had um, weird audio issues on the last webinar I did, so I just got like a little panic all of a sudden. Um, <laughs> So Allison asked, how did you manage all the paperwork um, involved in just getting getting ready to adopt? Like the it, not only the home study, but also, you know, working on your profile and getting all the details ready to just put yourselves out there. Um, I think um, 
one of the things with the with the paperwork uh, was keep trying to keep all the paperwork in order. If you know the um, the first phase of, of things that had to be done, uh, interview the um, interviews, the um, uh, um, uh, background checks, and, and everything, and trying to keep uh, pretty much good records, uh, detailed records of where you are and what's to be expected next um, and prepare for that next phase, contacting your friends for uh, their interview and their uh, background checks and letting them know what uh, they, um, what to expect and um, can continuously um, update your friends. Because once you move forward and you list your friends and notify your friends, they're going to be contacted. So it's a matter of continuously keep them updated as well and what to expect and when they may be talking with um, with someone and uh, everything. But um, all the records and, and, and paperwork and everything just keep separate from everything else. Taxes, we had a, a taxes and, and everything, but the adoption paperwork and, and all, we kept separate and try to keep in a, a uh, an order of okay this is going to be next this is what's what we have to do now and this is what we have to prepare for and uh so forth but the paperwork is it seems overwhelming but it's not because <laughs> yeah. when you look at it it's just okay this is necessary but be prepared to do um be extensive with your uh background um and um the um uh going forward because it's always going to be some more that they're going to need uh more information and so forth just be prepared to give as much information as possible and as asked for you know? yeah. yeah i i like that idea we even had um ashley chimed in she said there's so much paperwork but honestly it helps to have the mindset of tackling one thing at a time even an hour a day equals a lot of progress in one week um so I think, I think that's so smart. Well, and you were talking about how you felt. I, I can, because I'm like that too. I'm a little bit, even my mom probably struggled as a child. I was even the type of person that was like, I'm not going to tell too many people until maybe something's already happened or I'm for sure I know what I'm going to do. And it would be hard. It feels a little vulnerable to say, hey, friends and family, we are going to adopt um, and we're starting the process and just sort of wondering what are they going to think and and do they support that? And then usually people are reassured and comforted and excited to see that positive feedback from friends and family, but also on that logistic side too, that part of doing a home study is asking, um, well, every state's a little different, but for instance, they might say, you know, you need three reference letters or three references and only one of them can be related to you. So then you need to reach out and get a couple friends involved. And I, I love what you said about that, Aaron, is just keeping them in the loop too, because, you know, you don't need to keep them kind of on the hook wondering, you know, when am I going to get this call about the interview about you guys? Like you really are keeping everyone just at the pace um, so that you're checking things off and knowing what's next, but also who to bug if you know that that friend is holding up your process. <laughs> Absolutely, even including uh, the pastor, uh, because that's, I'm, I'm sure that was one of the ones that we had to have in the loop as well. And um, just like Aaron said, making sure that everyone knows what uh, he or she needs, um, especially the, the profile, um, the little recommendations that they have and going after them for pictures. Some of them didn't want to give up pictures. So it, it can be a process, but you just have to stay on top of them. And they were, they were more than willing to do it, but you just, you just have to stay on top of everybody. We have um, a very, 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 very good um, um, group of friends that we call family. I call them sister and brother, and they're church friends. We are very close. And once we um, let them know that we were uh, deciding to adopt, the immediate thing from, from them was after the ooh and ah and, and congratulations and everything <laughs> was okay what can we do how can we help and Absolutely. more um than uh more friends than we thought we only need you know you only need three i believe uh, six, re six yeah. references but um uh, we could have used more i mean that was uh the friends and the support that you have and not only that but um if 
something was the setback, we were to have a setback or something like that or whatever, having those friends there to call and talk to and say, okay, we've had a little setback or it, something didn't go as, as well or something, the support from them rather than having maybe one or two friends, it was several. Oh. And not only that, but the relatives as well. So uh, putting everything into place and having friends, um, it makes uh, a little easy, well, a lot easier to have that foundation of, of friends, uh, family that's very supportive so that if you do have a setback or something, um, uh, you may uh, be halfway through and um, um, the birth mother may change your mind or something, whatever you may have, you have those groups of friends that are just closest family mm -hmm. that you can fall back on and not um, just go through it, go alone. Through it alone. Yeah. yeah. So, and prayer warriors and um i i love that we're talking about this because i don't think it comes up a lot but i will say over my years at lifetime there have been several families who have said we're not we're not telling our friends and family we've only told the minimum number of people to help us qualify to adopt but outside of that they're they kept it very private and i think it was sometimes out of those fears um of well wants to say it, it's real, or what are people going to say back? But instead, whenever I hear people actually talk about sharing it, the the results are usually just overwhelmingly positive and that you have an abundance of people just saying, what can I do to be there for you through this? What can I do to help and praying for you and encouraging you um, and, and just being those cheerleaders who are going to shout for joy when you do bring your baby home. So I appreciate you kind of going backtrack in all those days um, ago that you had to go through those early steps of even just sharing it and deciding to be brave and put it out there. Um, let's talk a little bit, um, you know, a big, sometimes a big part of um, coming to adoption is also deciding what type of adoption you want to pursue. And when people want to adopt a newborn in the U.S., they have to start understanding, okay, what what can I expect? What do I know? Or what do I think about open adoption? So I would love if we could just briefly kind of touch on what you thought about open adoption before you were matched. And then let's talk about that moment when you got the call that a birth mother had chosen you. And now looking back, how, how it looks so much differently because of your relationship with that one woman. So what did you think about open adoption in the very beginning? Was that hard to wrap your minds around? It, it was new. Um, I don't think I had done a whole lot of research on adoption period prior to that. And I think that I just always assumed that adoption was closed. I don't think I even knew of it as in terms of open or closed. I just always thought that um, at least from what I can remember, people growing up and finding out, you know, when they were maybe early teens or accidentally that they were adopted and then going on this journey if if that's something that they wanted to do to find their birth parents. And so I don't know that I had an opinion one way or the other about open adoption, but once hearing about it, I was, I thought it was a fantastic idea mm -hmm. uh, because I just never um, wanted the thought of, of someone having to grow up and find out uh, happenstance or sit someone down, you know, later in life and, and say, uh, oh, by the way, we're not your your biological parents. So I, I just thought that the idea of the whole concept was was novel and, and a great one. Mm -hmm. um, it was, um, I kind of had a um, mixed feelings at first. And the reason was because once um, um, we had adopt and it was, you know, open adoption, it was looking at that. And I thought maybe, well, later on, there's a possibility of the, uh, uh, birth parents or whatever, the, uh, a conflict or something like that um, there. And <clears throat> excuse me, um, I just put that aside and said, okay, um, as a parent, I would want what would be best for the child. And eventually with them growing, growing up and as early as they would ask uh, or wonder, hey, um, my eyes are not like yours or something, or um, how come um, my nose is different from yours and mom's or, or something um, and explain it to them. But with uh, the possibility of the uh, birth parents um, um, coming back and, and, and uh, with, with something, that was just a challenge that I put to the side uh, 
and I said, okay, cross that hurdle or whatever when, I, when we get to it. But um, going forward, uh, if the um, parent is uh, wants to open adoption, uh, they'll you know hear things that um, um, we would like and looking at their needs and wants as well because um, in the back of her the birth mother's mind, I know five, 10 years down the road, there's always that thought of if there's no contact whatsoever, it's still going to pop up. And, sure, you know, they'll never forget. And mothers, it, yeah. it does, you know, so um, the thing is, we have to um, just, I, a great birth mother. Yeah, you know, we hit it, the jackpot. We hit the uh-huh. jackpot. I was, you know, just, it couldn't be better. Um, she, terrific, wonderful person um, with, you know, um, no um, uh, worries or, or, or uh, concerns, and um, with us, it's just be it's a just a great relationship with her. Um, so mm-hmm. my ease, my uh, worries will put the uh, uh, at ease, and I put them on the back burner uh, way beforehand. Just um, willing to accept uh, whatever hurdle came up. We're just gonna slow down, go over it, and then continue on. Yeah, I like what you said, Aaron, about um, how as a parent, you have to think about what's best for your child and that you knew someday your child would have questions. Um, And that right there sometimes can be enough to motivate an adoptive family to think, okay, I have to see outside of my just maybe the fears of, well, I don't know anyone um, I don't know anyone who has an open adoption. Like, what would that even look like? Would I be, would I ever feel like I'm not mom and dad? You know, would, would anything threaten my family in any way by having open adoption? But then looking at, okay, but what could it give me to answer some of those questions for my child, even medical history or something? But then what I hear more and more is what you both said about hitting the jackpot with your son's birth mother, because I think that when you remember it's one woman, it's not 12 or 20 different women that you're getting to know and and having these possible relationships with it's this one woman that you are taking time to get to know and and why she's choosing adoption and getting that peace of mind as as you move through the process together um i think it's really common even on the birth mom side to think what would adoption even look like with these people i don't even know who they are yet and it can be kind of scary to think about having a relationship with a stranger what would that be like um But what you said, I think it's normal to have those mixed feelings, but you both seem to handle it by just getting more information and talking to each other. What do we want? What do we think about this? And then also just being open to, okay, maybe there's something we don't know yet because we don't know her and handling it based on who she is. So we got a great question, and this is always one of my favorite parts of adoption stories too, but um, Matthew asked, um, I would be interested in hearing the story of the day you got the call about Zachary's birth mother. So can we go back there to where um, his story started? Absolutely. We, yeah. both, <laughs> we both just smiled because oh, wow. uh, it, it was the day that, uh, first of all, Aaron was actually off. So that was a miracle in itself. And, and I work from home. So um, I'm, we're in my office as we speak. So I, I work from home and um, I got the the call and it was a no, no ID or something. I forget how it, it shows private ID or whatever, but I remember it from, you know, listening to, to web, webinars in the past that when you got the call, that's typically how it comes through. And I don't typically get those kind of calls. So my heart just kind of skipped to be from there. <laughs> and when I answered the call, it was Diane Schaefer and she's, she just so calmly and matter of factly said that uh, there was a birth mother interested in us. And then she just started naming, like going over the stuff. And I'm just sitting there with my mouth open and I couldn't believe it. And I just went, um, I don't know why I didn't, I just went out the door and was trying to get Aaron's attention. And I think I just covered the phone and I called his name. And uh, what did you say? Yeah, um, I was in in the bedroom and which is like on the other side of the house and Kim's office is in the, um, on the other side. So there's the dining room, the living room, dining room, and then our, our bedroom. And I was in the bedroom and it's kind of like one of those things where if um, there can be a hundred kids out there running around or whatever, and one of the kids can say, mom, 
and the mom would instantly recognize her child's voice. Well, this so happened, Kim called my name and when she said it, it was like something else. It wasn't like panic. It wasn't like, um, uh, uh, I, I can't describe it, but it, I knew it was something important and she didn't yell. She just normally calmly said it, but it sounds as if she yelled it out and I came running out thinking, okay, what's wrong? What's just happened? Uh, is it something with work or she got to go or something, something different in her voice. Um, and I can honestly say of the, of the 14 years we, we've been married and the, the years we were dating, I've never heard her uh, call my name like that as opposed <laughs> to come here quick. So when I came and came out of the bedroom and I uh, came and I looked at her and I saw her face, it just said it all. It, it wasn't anything like, okay, we just um, uh, got all uh, six numbers right on the lottery or uh, we Maybe just want well, two yeah. new cars or uh, anything. The look on her face said it all. And it was almost in tears. But I think with my expression, my reaction, just like, okay, you no, know, that's it's, it's cool <laughs> and kind of calm. But inside, I'm bubbling over to find out what, what's going on. And eventually, she, when she told me, I was extremely excited. We were both excited. We broke down. Yeah, and, definitely. <laughs> um, uh, the, the sheer joy of it. And at that point, it wasn't the fact of, um, okay, what's the, what's the parents going to be like? All those questions or anything. It was just this, the fact of uh, someone had, uh, had chosen us. Chosen us, us yeah. yes. And um, nothing else, nothing else mattered. It was just the fact of being chosen. Oh. Um, and we were just elated about that. And then once we continued to talk and, and uh, get more information and everything, uh, the day just got better and better and better. Absolutely. And of, co of course, I think uh, a few days later, we let our friends know. Did we tell them right away? I'm not sure. I'm not sure uh, when we, we told yeah, them. Yeah, we were on you know. cloud nine. I think yeah. we waited till after we, we spoke with her. But... Yeah, and got more information and everything. How yeah. far along was she in her pregnancy when, when Diane called you? So, because this was, um, it was, it was um, mid, it was early September. early September. So she was due, um, she was due November 11. Okay. And so it was, it was early September when she called. So she only had a few months left. And um, yeah, I was, I, I remember that when I was talking to Diane or when Diane was kind of giving me all the, you know, just kind of giving me the information, telling me a little bit about her and uh, about the gender and just, you know, different parts of it. Um, I felt like I held it together until the very end. And then um, I can still remember to this day, Diane said, oh, <laughs> it was so funny uh, after the fact. But I think she knew that I was just overcome because I could barely end the call. Um, I was just so full. And then like Aaron said, we just, we just, after we hung up, we just broke down. So yeah, that ad adrenaline crash, um, just Absolutely. the realities. Well, cause, cause it is like, it's such a vulnerable process and you keep it together and some days are harder, but you, you two had already walked through many years of just wondering, you know, is is becoming parents together going to be possible for us? Is this in our future? Absolutely. When is this going to happen? And so then you get a call like that. Um, I can only imagine just like, <laughs> just that <laughs> crash, you know, of, whoa, we're here. Um, Absolutely. But I know there's still, you know, there's still that chance, like just because you're talking with her, it doesn't mean it could go anywhere, but it can be really reassuring to know, okay, the process is working. This is heading somewhere. Um, Absolutely. So there was a question I got. I love this. Um, what advice would you give to waiting families to be as prepared as possible to talk with the birth mom for that first time? Um, I think, well, one of the things that, that I did specifically was to go on the Lifetime website and I actually printed off the checklist. There was somewhere on the site that actually had suggestions of what to do and what not to do. When, when speaking to the birth mother. So I literally printed that page out and, and was prepared, you know, to, um, to, to talk with her. And um, so when we spoke with her, uh, she was just such a genuine and sweet person. Like it, it just flowed. We spoke, it was over an hour. Yes. We, we talked over an hour. Um, 
because uh, when she called, we just, it, it just flowed naturally. Um, and the first thing we both wanted to know was why us? Like, why did you choose us? Mm -hmm. And um, she said that we reminded her of, of her parents and the way, the relationship that she had with her parents. And, um, and she wanted that for her little boy. And um, it wasn't, you know, sometimes it's, uh, at least for me, sometimes you go into things thinking it's going to be this horrible sob story and that she didn't have parents or didn't have a good relationship, but she did. And she wanted that same thing that she knew that she couldn't give for this little boy. And, and so that was a positive that she saw in us uh, what she experienced growing up because she said that she was had the privilege of, of being involved in things and traveling and being exposed uh, to sports and arts and education. And, um, and she just wasn't in a position to do that for, for this little boy and wanted to, to have um, someone to do that. Mm -hmm. And one of, the, uh, one of the main things um, prior to uh, speaking with her is uh, for you to be uh, just non-judgmental and no yeah. uh, uh, reasons or no questions in reference to um why what's going on in your life or anything like that Absolutely. we were um extremely happy and, and glad that she had chosen us and if if she would have uh mentioned the reasons why or something like that just uh understanding being supportive of her uh for her choice and um just being non-judgmental of what may have transpired prior to her life or at this point right now or why she's doing or anything, just being non-judgmental, just totally supportive um, and just uh, reassuring her of, uh, uh, of things are going to be great and okay, um, but yeah. not trying to lash out or anything, just being non-judgmental because who knows what the uh, birth mother's reason may be. They're all going to have you know different reasons and um, everything, but just being um, supported. Yeah, thanks for saying that, because um, I know that that sometimes can be a huge uh, shift because most adoptive parents, you know, you're in the situations you're in because you have made choices in your life that have put you on a stable path where you are right now. And usually you have resources and a supportive network and um, maybe just more going on in your life, even though you long for a child, you have more going on in your life than a lot of these women who call thinking about adoption in this season that they're going through. And it can be really hard. Like I know working here that just my friends and family, a lot of times it blows people's mind because they just think, how, how do people live like that? Or how do people make those choices? And I'm always like, it's she's she's making a brave choice just to even research adoption let alone when they actually go through the process so you can't you can't put yourself in her shoes because you've never walked there before like she's in her situation and all you can do is be understanding and available to her and supportive um so i really appreciate that you said that because i think that sometimes you can get a little hung up on well why why are you doing this like you want to backtrack all their life choices instead of just being mm -hmm. present with her Right. Um, really, I love that you brought that up. Thank you. Um, so you were matched for a couple months. Um, but were you surprised when you hung up with her that first time at how well it went? Or did you feel like you were unsure if you were actually going to pursue the match? Or how did things end that first time? It, it was it was absolutely mind blowing. Um, it, it was such a good conversation. Like I said, we spoke over an hour. And, um, and she, um, the things that she wanted for him, um, she volunteered things like it just, it blew our mind. Like it didn't happen because in the, in the hospital, logistically, it wasn't a good fit, but she offered to, uh, to express breast milk because of that first, um, Oh, I forget what it's called, but the first. Oh, um, yeah, the colostrum. Yeah. Yes. So because of that, and I just thought, wow, who even does that? Um, and it was such a sweet gesture that she said, I would love to do that for you guys. Um, she just, and she asked us how comfortable 
uh, we both were. She asked Aaron if he was okay with being in the um, room and cutting mm -hmm. the cord. And um, again, this little stinker came so fast that none of that actually <laughs> happened. Uh, he he was born before we could get out of uh, the airport. But uh, but the I, the fact that she asked and offered, you know, was just phenomenal. And we were just, she was just so selfless. And she just kept saying uh, over and over, I'm happy to do this for you guys. Mm. And she said that, I don't know how many times. Yes. yes. Did you know any of her family? Did she let you interact with anyone in her side of the family? Um, we did meet her mother um, when she was discharged. Well, let's see, she was discharged the very next day. And, and then, which was it? Her mom had to pick her up. And that's how we met her mom. Uh, we would have met her mom and her son the first day, but it just traveling wise, by the time we got there, you know, the, he, he needed to go eat and that kind of thing. So we missed them, but we did meet her mom and, and she was a sweet, she was a very sweet lady as well. And, um, and it was, it, it, everything just went smoothly. Um, a couple of times in the hospital, people thought that I was uh, her mom's. <laughs> okay. um, so that was kind of funny uh, as well. But, um, you know, she, she was nice and, and her mom was very sweet as well. So the picture I brought back up was when we started with, but I know this is the first moment. So here you are in the hospital. I can see in the back, there's one of those little like hospital room chairs. Yes. Um, did they give you your own room to be with Zachary in the hospital? Well, the, that hospital does not do that. So that photo was taken in the room with the birth mother. She's right to my left in the bed okay. and um so she's sitting there in fact she took several pictures of us and she was <laughs> she was texting them to her it then. was funny <laughs> um so um so what happened is from the moment we we're holding him right there we never let him go again uh they came in and, and gave her some medication and she got drowsy and we left and there was a couple of doors down um, it was actually the room that they use for, I think, visitation. nursing and yeah. visitation and that kind of thing. And they let us have that room. There was not a bed in there, but everything else was in there. So there was a shower, there was a sink, and there, were, um, there was a reclining chair and, and a TV and everything but a bed. Um, so we just made a pallet. They did give us pillows and blankets. And so that first night we slept on the floor. And um, if I'm not mistaken, was it the first night that we one of us go to Walmart? We we were very uh, yeah we oh, so we saw our ingenuity so and we <laughs> went to, to uh, Walmart and we purchased a full size air, air mattress, mattress and a pump and uh, and so we slept on the floor on that air mattress and uh, and so we did for the two two three days that we were there we slept there and they let us and they were just so sweet and they they just kept telling us one person has to be awake yeah. so we took shifts yeah. and they would come and get Zachary and mm -hmm. do whatever they needed to do and were you going to say something mm -hmm. um when we were in the room um because um Zach wasn't in the nursery normally at, at the the birth mothers there they'll come in um let the birth mother feed the the child and then they'll take the the child or the baby back to That's the nursery. Right, to the nursery. To the nursery. But because we were there and um uh there's always someone in the nursery that's working. Um but because we had Zach and we were in the room, um they had to have been someone have, someone has to be awake the whole time. So Kim and I just took shifts of being awake and watching over Zachary as he slept. Uh, when he woke up, changing them, uh, uh, feeding them again, and keeping track of when he ate and everything, how yeah, much he ate. Yeah, we had to write it on the board so and all that. We had uh, detailed records, and I would think that um, after the first uh, couple of hours during the middle of the night, uh, one of the nurses came in and just just uh, came in and brought the milk in, uh, you know, the to formula. to formula in for him to feed to to feed, and then just walk back out. <laughs> because before they would come in and check and everything, but we were some one of us was always up greeting at the door and, and just wide awake. And they was like, okay, uh, they felt comfortable. The staff did comfortable yeah. in us being there. And once we had gotten the, the, the mattress, air mattress, and uh, laid it out and everything, and had Zachary, um, they were very comfortable. So it eased their um, uh, 
fears a little bit because I'm pretty sure they may have not know what to think. They may well, have just if uh, you remember, they said that, and I don't know how many adoptions they had, you know, encountered, yes. but they told us that we are the first couple that ever was there and and stayed with the adoptive child. They said that their experience was was that adoptive parents would go stay at a hotel. Right, and then and, come back. and then come back, and so the baby would would be in the care of the nursery, right. and we were like, no, we're not leaving. <laughs> so, I don't think so. <laughs> well, I mean, like you said, they didn't, because every hospital is different. Sometimes even in the mm -hmm. same city, every hospital can be a little different. So, they may have had, say, a nursing staff or someone tell other adoptive parents before, well, no, we don't have a room for you. And so then those people just, they didn't think like uh -huh. you, like we'll set up uh -huh. camp wherever, <laughs> you know, but since they had, yeah. it sounds like since they had the space available in that, in the nursing or the visitor room or whatever that was, that they were able to spare it sort of unofficially, I would guess. Exactly. Um, exactly. Be, but they were very sweet. Well, but I will say, um, I mean, you have such a unique relationship with his birth mom, too, that they may have even been surprised just to know that she was comfortable with that as well. Um, mm -hmm. That may have been one of the first times that they have seen that kind of adoption unfold anyway. Um, that's, yes. that's possibly, very yes. possibly. And I'm certain that they did talk with her um, uh, once we were there and then everything and then she eased their fears as well how comfortable she was with us and the, that started w with our first conversation and our second conversation and us um, uh, tracking her and everything and opening that line of communication just anytime uh, any questions whenever you call you know just call us um, and that ease her fears uh, and uh, doubts a lot because you can look at the profile and everything of someone, a birth mother can, and then once she talks or, or meets them uh, by phone and everything, it can be something different or totally different. She may get another mindset. So in the process, uh, the adoption, making your uh, booklet and your video, um, being as um, honest and upfront as, as possible because you go, you want to be genuine and that person meet uh the same person that they meet or see in the and read about in the booklet and see on the on the video has to be the same person that they meet and talk with over the phone yeah. um and that was one of the things that uh I, I believe she was very very comfortable with uh and when she finally met us and we were just genuine and it helped a lot that we had talked a, a great deal about just about everything yeah, yeah. So, um, what, since the relationship started off so great with her, what does that look like now between you um, and his birth mother? It's still really great. And I, let me just go back, if I might add too, and just say in, in, in the scheme of everything falling into place, the, the morning that we got the call <laughs> that she was in labor, that was Aaron and, and my 13th wedding anniversary. Oh, so Zachary goodness. was born on our anniversary. So, <laughs> and she thought, she thought that that was just meant to be as well. The birth mother was like, that, there's just no question this was meant there's to be. There's a whole story. So, to yeah. So, yeah. I, anyway, I just kind of wanted to backtrack <laughs> and share that. Um, so, um, about our relationship now, we, we continue um, at least once a month. To text. So um, she actually initiated it with the first four weeks because after the first four weeks, she text she texted and said happy one month anniversary. So she kind of set the precedence for that. And and so I text back and sent a picture. And so that's just been our thing. So every month on the fifth, I will I will text and text his you know as I call them month anniversaries, mm -hmm. and I will send her the photos for um, for all of his. So we we contact yeah. each other and um his birthday is coming up obviously and i uh texted her and told and sent a save the date and she sent back and said that um that she's already requested the day off and that she and her son would definitely love to come so oh. we are so looking forward to so, it and I, I hope that she's that actually able to to make it but oh that's my little munchkin on the six months <laughs> <laughs> in that little outfit um, <laughs> 
<laughs> so I love the sign behind him. It's my half birthday. Um, <laughs> I've always tried to get people on board with half birthdays, but I'm kind of in a lone, lone crowd over here. Um, <laughs> looking back, I mean, what you just said, like, we hope she will come to his first birthday. And when you go back to what you said in the beginning, when you started out, not even knowing that open adoption was possible or it could look like this or having those mixed feelings about what would that be like to have her in our as part of our story, but also in our lives. Um, what would you tell someone who hears that and thinks I'm not I'm not sure I personally would want my child's birth mother at their birthday party. Like, what would you say you've grown or seen differently because you actually walked through the adoption? It just changes. It, it's it's like um, it's hard to explain, but but you're right. You always you start out a little apprehensive because you don't know what that's going going to look like. Um, but it is just be, I think it's because with her, she was just so resolute from the very beginning, and 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 I don't say this in a negative way at all, but it was as if because she had made the decision that she made, those pictures are so cute, I can't stand it. So cute. Uh, it it's because it's like she was, her mind was so very made up that this was the right thing to do, that even when we spoke, like in the hospital, when she would, you know, when we were talking and we we're holding Zachary and she's, you know, she's still in, in the bed and we're talking and she would make comparisons like, you know, with his hair and, and this. And she, she said, I didn't have heartburn. And I was so surprised that he came with this head full of hair because it's, I mean, a head full of hair. And, and, she, and she would say things like, well, when my son was born, this and such, or when my son came and she would distinguish the two. And it was as if this is your son, but I'm comparing him to my son. And she yeah. said things like that, like all the time. And it, it was so amazing to me. And it was striking that she had made the separation in her head. It was, I, I told, I have told my friends this several times, the, her behavior in the hospital was as if she were a paid surrogate. And that's the best way that I can describe it. She was the sweetest and it was as if she was doing this for us all along. And that's, it's, it's weird, but that's the way it felt. Yeah. I've heard some, I've heard some birth mothers before say that they, they, they just start to think of the baby. They know that baby's theirs and they can never deny or forget. Um, and they will always share a deeper love um, you know, than any aunt or grandmother or relative could to this child. But at the same time that a lot of the women, when they get to that point of, I want to make an adoption plan, and then they actually know the real life people that they've chosen for that baby, that a lot of them feel that way, like I'm doing this for them. And that brings them a lot of pride. Um, it, it reassures their decision. Like you guys, through your story that I've heard today, I just keep hearing integrity. You started out, it gives me chills to think that because I think that that's the thread is you started out even with a profile of just saying, this is who we are, this is who you're gonna meet, who you're gonna talk to on the phone, this is who we're gonna be before and after the adoption. And it was the same the whole time and the fact that you were there for her and you showed up for her baby in this way and you were consistent and you, you built that trust because you were full of integrity and consistency and, um, and sincerity, I think, too, is just to know that you can be yourselves and be chosen just for who you are. And then it's going to actually benefit your adoption, that you're not trying to be someone else or you're not trying to over control the process, but you're just showing up and saying, we want to adopt this baby. What can we what can we do to be a part of this answer for you? And I think she really responded to that um, just in all the little ways that you absolutely grew together absolutely um so let's see i think i just quit i saw a question pop up um can we talk about how you chose his name did she have a say or did you ask her um how did you choose his name we we didn't ask her she asked she asked us if you know what if we had names picked out and that kind of thing and we um i don't know what the you know what the procedure is or how people typically 
pick out names, but we were just kind of throwing things out, throwing names out and agreeing and disagreeing on different names. And, um, and Aaron actually came up with Zachary. And when he did, I just loved it. It just sounded right. And, um, and then I think I came up with the middle name for Noah and, and that's, that's how that was. But, um, she, she just asked, you know, do, do you know what you're going to name him and that kind of thing. And she was all of those things she had already pre thought out. Like she, I think she, she let us know that that was something she wanted us to do. She didn't want to try to name him and we have to rename him or anything like that. She was just so incredibly accommodating and, and, and it was just a blessing. I think, um, I had written down uh, several names, uh, boy names, and had scratched a few off and had my favorite. And of course, I went through like A and uh, listed uh, names down, uh, you know, through the alphabets. And I got to Z and just Zachary came up and I just wrote it down. And as I began to write down, narrow it down to like five, I kept Zachary and I kept moving Zachary over and kept <laughs> Zachary there. And finally, I just said, you know, Zachary, it just stuck. And yeah, I, was, um, I decided on Zachary, and um, of all the uh, uh, nicknames that could be with with Zach and and Z and everything, I just Zachary, it just stuck. And once um, we decided on on Zachary, uh, that was the middle name. And of course, I had a another list of middle names and stuff too. But the thing was, I had Zachary, Noah, and a few other names listed as a first name. So uh, we chose Zachary as a, his first name and Noah as middle name. And of course, the second thought there was uh, keeping it uh, biblical because uh, I'm an Aaron and my middle name is Timothy. It stayed, with, you know, so it was just keeping it biblical. Um, and um, that was kind of easy because most of the names that we had listed were biblical. Um, and we just, we just wanted to stay with that, stay there. Um, but Zachary was, was one that just came up and just stuck. It just fits him. Yeah. And one of my friends uh, pointed out that, that we went from Aaron, uh, from Aaron to Zachary, from A to A Z. To Z. <laughs> so yeah. that, that picture that you showed before of that handsome young man with the dreads, uh, that's Aaron Jr. So that, that was his big brother yeah. holding him. And so that was uh, from A, A to Z, yes. from Aaron to Zachary. So oh, I you. love that. That's adorable. Um, I mean, if you have a few minutes, that is a topic I wonder, because a lot of people do come to Lifetime as blended families, and they have children on one side or the other, or sometimes both. Sometimes those children are young. Sometimes they're grown out of the house. But what has that been like for the children already in your family um, to welcome Zachary. Well, that that photo there, that was I don't remember what day that was. That wasn't Christmas Day, but mm. uh, Aaron, when he comes over, he gets Zachary and he's a baby hog, and he <laughs> will not put him down, and he won't let anyone else hold him, and he is so attached to him, and he is just awesome. And uh, and Audrey, uh, his sister, everyone has just been so very supportive. It, it's just been unreal. And he's just, I don't know, he's just a little, he's, he's a little nugget. And yeah. he, he gets passed yeah. around from church. That other photo uh, with him in the little red Nike outfit. By the way, he was formally dressed, but he had a blowout for the <laughs> gods. And so <laughs> that <laughs> that was his alternate outfit. Uh, but that's uh, that's actually my supervisors on either side uh, in the background. That was at a, uh, what was it, our end of the year banquet. And that was their first time yeah, meeting Zachary. And he got passed all around the room. And yeah. it, it's just, everyone has just been so, so supportive. And they, they all, everyone calls him his, their baby. So he's That's got more he's uncles. <laughs> so um, that was, oh, sorry about that, Aaron. Go ahead. Um, Aaron Jenny, um, because uh, Audrey, um, uh, he's the youngest. He has an older sister, Audrey, and um, he was the youngest. Uh, he has, you know, um, uh, another brother, but he just loved the idea of having a baby brother. You know, another baby brother, a baby brother, and that's you know uh, uh, that 
he, you know, holding stuff and he just um, lights up when he comes over and, and holds Zachary. Uh, um, he wants to play with him all the time. And once he's there, he's like, okay, I got him. Y'all go do something else. Yeah. I got him, <laughs> you know, uh, but he just loves him. So he's a hog for sure. Yeah, uh, he's been welcomed by the my, uh, uh, other kids and just as if he's, you know, was there all along. So uh, they just love him. It's been great. Well, your whole family, so you go from not being sure if you're ready to tell friends and family to now you have this baby and all these people that have been eagerly awaiting him. Um, Absolutely. And you can just see, I mean, sometimes there's this fear when you, even when you're waiting to adopt, to just wonder, what will it feel like to raise a child I adopt? Will my family, you know, at Christmas and birthdays and church, you know, will they look at my child any differently will they embrace him the same way and you can see these photos and know that like that doesn't even that's not even a concern like he's absolutely he's theirs absolutely and i i don't know why i've never um i forget to get a, a photo because our pastor makes an absolute beeline to get zachary every sunday and i wish that i had a photo of him because he is absolutely obsessed with zachary it's just <laughs> Um, and I think it's because he's been with us. He, obviously, he was one of the very first people that we shared it with, you know, before we actually shared it with everyone else. Um, and so I don't know if he just feels a part of the process. I don't know what it is, but he is just obsessed with him. And unfortunately, I don't have any photos of the pastor uh, coming um, to, to get him. But his, it's like he's the, the church baby <laughs> mascot or something. <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. But. <laughs> These photos were just taken a couple of days ago uh, in Charlotte. We yes. we just got back late last night, and um, those are uh, this this is Aaron's oldest uh, living relative. That's uh, my oldest living uh, cousin on the right there. Uh, uh, she's cousin in the 90s, Margie, right? yes, she's in the nineties, uh, I believe ninety four, ninety three or ninety four, and that's her husband on the left, uh, Otis. And that's uh, cousin Margie. She's my oldest living re relative. And in that photo, you have my uh, oldest living relative and youngest <laughs> uh, in one photo. And I cherish that photo. Uh, we went to uh, North Carolina this past weekend to see my cousins mm -hmm. and niece and everyone and my godmom and everyone. And this is one of the photos of my uh, uh, cousin. Um, and you see you. How, how he just, he just he lights just up, adorable. He, he just, played and yeah. everything. And the photo prior to that was uh, my godmom. Um, and she's she was part of the profile yeah, too. Yeah, she was part yeah. of the profile. Um, so this past weekend was uh, uh, a short, sweet weekend, but very, very uh, wonderful. A lot of time very spent with the family. So, but um, he's um, getting around. He's getting to know uh, <laughs> cousins and um, aunts and, and uh, everyone. So <laughs> he had a blast. Yeah. It's just it's just beautiful, and I think that when you show these kinds of photos to people who are waiting to adopt, I hope it encourages those of you wherever you are at in the process as you listen to let yourself picture these moments. Um, you know, that can be easy, I think, to just sort of like stow those away and not let yourself go down that path because maybe you went down that path years ago and you went through infertility or loss and it just didn't happen like you thought but it, but these moments will happen and I think that's one of the my favorite things about sharing adoption stories is letting other people waiting to adopt see that if it can happen for you it's going to happen for them um, you know so there was a photo here I'm trying to bring it up here of your dog and one of the questions you touched on it because you were starting to talk about your co-workers think of him as their baby um, <laughs> but a lot of people always want to know well how do I prepare because adoption can happen any moment some people don't even get a couple months like you guys did um, how did you prepare your work um, for the fact that you might be leaving at a moment's notice to go adopt well, um, for, for me, I, I have the best job ever um, at <laughs> work. Um, I work from home. I work remotely. So my all of my coworkers, my boss, everyone is in the state of Georgia, and I'm in the state of Alabama. That's one. Uh, so, uh, but no, it, it's a blessing to have a job where, where I work out of. I don't really work from home so much as out of home uh, because my job requires travels. But um, 
uh, they were just so supportive. Uh, what what we did is, I'm trying to remember when um, I, I started with HR. That was the person that I started with because I wanted to know what benefits um, were available to me. And, um, it, and it turned out it was awesome. So what we have is a family leave act and the way they allow you to do it is at my, they, I don't know how it turned out, but in the end, I was able to get thir thir um, 13 weeks off to be with Zachary and to bond. And I was paid the whole entire time. And I did save up my vacation. So if, if I remember correctly, I think I may have gotten um, maybe, I don't know, maybe nine or 10 of it was what they gave me. And then the rest was for my vacation. But anyway, with the combination of whatever the job gives plus my saved vacation, I was able to be out the entire 13 weeks with Zachary and um, nice with Aaron being in uh, uh, corrections and and well they work him like a yeah a dog a anyway so he had, had a lot lots of, of vacation available so and I was able to take um, uh, twelve weeks uh, right mm -hmm. there with Kim and with and be it home was awesome. and everything and one of the things that uh, mm. when we brought uh, Zachary home um, we had our, our dog uh, Nico was uh, being trained and we had him with a trainer. Uh, and what he had told us to do was once uh, we get a, get Zachary, um, something of something of Zachary, like a blanket or something that he'd been in or wrapped in, you know, for a day or so or something I had, a, had with him, get it, put it in um, a, a bag and send it, uh, send it back to, uh, to him so that uh, he would let, um, Nico let the dog smell it and get used to the scent of a new one, uh, a newborn, you know, get used to Zachary's scent. And so that when we brought Zachary home, he would already be used to the scent of him and know that, okay, I'm used to that. I know him. I know this, this is a familiar scent and everything. Yeah. And there wouldn't be, uh, oh, who's this new person coming in? Uh, you know, a little animosity or something there or whatever. But um, uh, that was, uh, something that I, if you do have a pet, have a dog uh, or something, uh, introducing the, the scent of the, uh, the newborn to the dog uh, prior to bringing them home, if you can do that. Uh, and the best way to do that is something that the child has or has been wrapped in, uh, worn uh, for a day or if you had a blanket or something, uh, a, a day or two or something like that, uh, send it so that the, the pet can be, uh, uh, get used to the scent or smell it and hold it. Uh, just keep it let him smell it and uh, get used to the scent. So when you bring it home, he's, hey, that's, I'm familiar with that scent and it's friendly. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, uh, what we did also was, uh, as we showed uh, Zachary attention and played with him and everything, showed uh, uh, Nico uh, just as much attention so that he's not uh, being shunned away or, or left out or anything that is, you know, is friendly. And uh, they get along very well. Um, <laughs> yeah. Zachary is, he's crawling now. And, um, what he, a few days ago, well, a few weeks ago, uh, he was crawling around. Nico was laying, sitting on the floor, and uh, <laughs> Zachary just kind of grabbed Nico by his coat and everything, and leaned forward and, and just bit him. And Nico yeah. just turned around and looked like, okay, it's you. All right, let it go. <laughs> and then, you know, it was just, it was just the funniest thing. Normally, if you, Nico is, you, can rub him and pet him, but uh, biting him or something like that, he's gonna get up and you know just move away or something or, or run off. But he just turned and looked and said, "Okay, it's just you." And uh, Zachary will, uh, uh, if he's on the floor uh, and crawling, Nico comes up sometimes and uh, uh, will just play with him and, and lick his face. And Zachary just squinches his eyes and just says, "Okay, hurry up, you know." <laughs> you know, so they get along very, very good. And that's one of the things that. If you have multiple pets, definitely uh, introducing the, the, if you're going to bring a child home or, you know, uh, introduce the, the scent to the uh, pet as well. And just um, try to get the pet incorporated with the, the playtime and um, uh, just as much attention as you do the, um, your, your, your child. Yeah, we're getting some comments saying, I love that you're talking about this because it's not something that we get to touch on a lot. But um it's so wise. Um, like I know I have 
I have a dog and she can be a little skittish and shy, especially of new, anything that's new or change. And so that is especially a helpful tip if you have an animal that maybe can be a little um, protective, like they're safe, but maybe they're a little guarded or skittish or shy. Um, send something on ahead home um, and have your dog sitter or your pet sitter, or whatever, um, introduce that to them. Um, I think that's, I, I love this topic. We could probably do a whole webinar <laughs> on a panel about, you know, letting your pet know they're not ignored. And because for a lot of people, you know, that pet is that first baby in the home kind of thing. And, oh, he you know, was, for yes, sure. Yes, he was. He was uh, <laughs> spoiled. Definitely spoiled. And by um, him being able to do, have run of the mill of the house or whatever, you know, uh, now uh, he still has run of the mill of the house. And for the longest, um, he was um, uh, wouldn't come into the nursery, or he would come in and, and leave right back out. Um, and uh, since Zach got a little older, uh, and we, you know he was able to come in and he was play, and he would still come in uh, the nursery and want to play, just as he did if he was in the living room. And we would play with him in there, and he would bring his toy and stuff. And now it's uh, it's like it's the norm. Uh, he loves to play. Um, and when Zachary's crawling, he would come up and want to play with him. Uh, slob him slob down. Him, yeah, yeah, lick his face. And, <laughs> you know, and then, uh, of course, he'd come in, uh, and Zachary, uh, he got used to Zachary's cry. And he would get up from his uh, bed that he would be sleeping in. And when Zachary was crying, he would come to the nursery, the door, and look in and everything, and see it when we went in and everything. And he would then... Uh, kind of sit and sit in the nursery and just sit down and, mm. you know, uh, sit by the door and stuff. So he's gotten to that big brother guardian, guardian mode now. Uh, quick. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> he's in the pack. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, there was another photo too, if we could just briefly touch on a question I got earlier and you had a photo even about it, but a lot of people want to know well, when, when did you set up your nursery? Did you do that ahead of time or did you wait until you knew more about Zachary? No, we, we set it up ahead of time. This photo was taken though after we had gotten matched. So at this point, we, we've completed it. So we, um, we actually painted and in fact, uh, just going back a little bit, we had run out of profiles and we had gotten a request to send in more and to you know freshen up some of the photos and one of the photos that we freshened up was the nursery well because we didn't know the gender all we had was the the bed the furniture you know and the chair and all of that and um and then it this all the the dots and you can tell that we've got zachary's name there and all that that was added after the fact but um we were <laughs> we were going for a gender neutral color for the room and I'm not sure how the photo looks to everyone else, but it actually looks a little more on the grayish side, grayish blue, which is exactly what we intended. However, in person, it's blue. <laughs> and so um, when we started painting, we were like, oh, man, it's blue. And, and we just decided, oh, well, if it's a girl, we'll, we'll add some pink. <laughs> and uh, we, were, we were not going to go back and repaint. Um, but yeah, we did. We got it ready. Um, we. Uh, Toys or Us, when they went had that big uh, liquidation going out of business, mm -hmm. we were able to get that um, that very nice convertible bed that you see in the dresser. Um, and I think I went on Amazon and found a chair and we had already just redone the carpet. And um, so, yeah, we were ready. We were ready. We just bought gender neutral things. <coughs> and um, and like I said, on this photo, we were um, we had been matched when Aaron was getting ready. We were hanging curtains, I think, uh, yes. right there. And, uh, the, um, uh, I think I was putting the hooks in for the curtains. Yeah. But um, to back up, um, we started preparing the nursery uh, prior to being matched. And because it was just like uh, having the faith and knowing that it's going to happen. So be prepared when it does Absolutely. happen. Absolutely. So we started preparing the nursery and everything. And um, Kim says, we painted the um, the nursery, but we didn't paint it. Kim painted the nursery. <laughs> I was gonna help paint, but I was like, okay, well, I'll paint when, when I get home today. Uh, we'll uh, we'll paint. But she went and got the 
the the paint uh, um, color and everything. And well, I came we home, the color, yeah. Remember, yeah. But we got the color. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> I came home and she had already painted, and I'm like, "Thanks, I'm, honey." I'm, shocked. I'm like, "Okay, um, <laughs> now, now to to just to <laughs> just to put my two cents in." Uh, when friends come over and everything, and we say uh, we prepared the nursery and everything, I say, yeah, I helped. But all I did was put up the dots, the paint, <laughs> the, the name, the, the everything Kim did. And she did a fabulous. I mean, it looks beautiful um, when we show friends and everything uh, that came over and saw the nursery. Uh, it looks great and i just had oh, to put yes, two cents in and yeah. say hey i put up all them dots you know but she yeah, did you did. 90% you of the little yeah. the, 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 um, uh, elephant there on the wall and every, just everything so all i did was just come in and put up you know a couple of dots and i'm trying to take all the credit <laughs> <laughs> that's all right was, uh, from a few days ago we did the uh the what was it called the helena hollow so yeah. that was the little pumpkin patch, pumpkin patch kind of thing. He was not in a smiling mood there. Yeah. But, but he's got so big. Yeah. Um, <laughs> gone from baby to almost walking, getting his almost little boy shoes out there. And <laughs> um, I just so glad for you guys to spend time with us today. <laughs> we just had a couple comments come up said, I just love this couple. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I know that your story and your tips um, especially have been helpful today, but if, you know, is there anything left that you'd want to um, tell people who are waiting to adopt or just thinking about it? Is there anything you want to say before we wrap up? There, there was one thing that was on my mind that, um, that I feel like might be helpful and it was during the waiting process. Mm -hmm. um, there obviously are going to, you know, be times when you wonder when, or if it's gonna ever happen, you know? Um, not that our wait was all that terribly long, but it's it can seem long. Um, my suggestion would be, and this is one of the things that we had decided early on, is that we're not gonna sit in a chair and twiddle our thumbs and wait to, you know, to get that phone call to be matched. And what we did with, with our wonderful circle of friends is we went out and we did things. Um, I think we probably did more things last year than we had ever done. Like we went, we went to New Orleans for New a weekend. Yeah. We went to uh, uh, Chattanooga, Chattanooga. Uh, with friends. We did some. Uh, we we rode those uh, segways. We did segways. a segway tour. Um, oh, yeah. We just did. A, we 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 kept busy because we were like, this is. We've done all we've gonna do. We we made the profile. We've done everything on our end that we were supposed to have done. And now we're, we're going to wait, but we're not going to stop life while we wait. Mm -hmm. And um, I just felt like that was a good thing. And I would recommend it. I just, to take your mind off of it because to just obsess about it doesn't help anything. And uh, hopefully that would be helpful to someone. But I, I would suggest that while, you know, after you've done your profile and your video and done all the requirements on your end, to, to live life. And, and when it's time to happen, you're going to get that call. Mm -hmm. I, I literally just this morning was messaging with one of Lifetime's families who adopted, oh, about 11 or, mm, I guess probably 11 years ago now. And uh, she said, I wish I would have enjoyed the journey more than I than yes. I did at the time. I just I just wanted it to happen. I wanted to get through it. She said, but in hindsight, I wish I had just let myself enjoy the journey to adoption. Um, and it's probably a good recommendation for most things in life, but it is really easy to feel like, well, the weight is such a huge, obvious point in my story right now, but I love your tips, Kimberly, and thank you. Thank you for saying that. Don't just wait. Go out and go out and do some things, make some memories at that time. Absolutely. Yes, and it helps to um, pass the time and kind of takes your mind away from it uh, when you're with friends and enjoying uh, time with friends. And um, occasionally you're gonna have uh, a friend that, that you know, gonna say, you know, ask you a question. Is it time, did you hear anything? Did you hear anything? And you may get that uh, once or twice a week. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and you haven't heard anything and you don't want to give them anything. But um, 
you have you want to say something so uh and not tell them hey you know uh you asked me last week and not uh, just continue <laughs> to be uh, cordial mm -hmm. and um continue to, to uh just just be cordial and for the most and most importantly just have faith that it's going to happen it, if it's not three months or six months or, or, or nine months it's going to happen and what we looking back realize is that when we made the decision to move forward with adoption and everything was right about the time that um uh, exactly kids, was probably conceived exactly was conceived <laughs> <Probably>. <laughs> so what i what i um like to think is that once we made the decision to uh, adopt the seed was planted and he was ours well we didn't know it at the time but uh having faith and believing uh it fell into place everything fell into place and when we sent in the second profile of everything we had already been chosen exactly but she didn't <laughs> let anyone know you know she looked and everything and said okay this is my decision and that was weeks um prior to us actually being contacted her actually contacting uh the agency and everything so what we did was just continue to pray and keep faith and mm -hmm. not give up uh, there's a an average timeline um that it may happen where it's okay uh depending on the type of uh child um that you uh, want to adopt um or uh, a gender or something like that you know yeah. a certain time frame but uh if it doesn't happen within that time frame is to keep moving forward just, just never give up and never stop thank you thank you both um the comments coming in are just very positive um thanking you both for taking time to share so we are really grateful and um i just i love being able to share stories like this um we didn't touch on everything i know there were some questions out there that um we couldn't get to today um but I hope, that, I hope that for all of you who are listening, whatever stage you're in right now, that there was something you could take away today that would encourage you to keep going um, and pursuing that story that you're being called to complete and actually to begin. I mean, the moment you adopt is actually really just the beginning of your story uh, with that child too. But right now you have you have this footwork and you have this season right now to move through to get there. And, and as Aaron said, to just keep praying and keep the faith and not to give up. Um, and as you started out today, just saying, you know, to, to get more information and talk together about where you want this to go. But just remember that all of us here at Lifetime are happy to answer any questions for you, whether you're already working with us, you can always reach out to your coordinator. She's happy to give you the clarity or point you to another webinar or, or information that might help. But if you are just starting to explore Lifetime too, let us know, let us know what questions are on your mind so that we can give you the information you need to make the best decision for your family's future too. So Aaron and Kimberly, thank you again for being with us today. Today. It was our Thank pleasure. You. Thank you. Um, if any of you have questions or feedback from today's webinar, we would love to hear from you. You can always um, follow us on social media too. We'd love to see you pop up there. Um, but for now, we will sign off and, and hopefully meet with all of you again soon. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks again for joining us. Bye-bye.